Six Flags Great Adventure is one of the largest amusement parks in the world and can be found in Jackson, New Jersey, USA. Its strategic location between New York City and Philadelphia grant it high attendance numbers of up to 3.4 million visitors each year. Six Flags Great Adventure is sort of a legend in the world of coasters and theme parks as it's known to be one of the crown jewels of the Six Flags chain. Once upon a time, they were spoiled with all sorts of crazy new roller coaster additions and today they boast 14 individual screen machines. But is the park really as good as it seems on paper? In this video, I'll give my two cents on the park because I have a love-hate relationship with Six Flags Great Adventure. My first visit to the park was in August 2020, and it was good, but not great. It was apparent that the park suffered a lot of issues that the Six Flags chain had been known for over the years. This includes slow operations, cleanliness that many would consider to be below average, and staff that didn't seem like they cared to be of any assistance. A primary example is when I saw two guys in line for food who were accidentally charged twice on their card, and when they noticed something was wrong, they confronted the cashiers and they said that they could not help him. Hey, yo, your customer service skills is like horrible. Then a loud argument broke out, and and things escalated at park authorities. Staff aside, this park's clientele has never been the best either. I remember a guy line jumping to get to his party in the station of El Toro, and instead of saying, excuse me, he physically picked me up and moved me out of the way. I had never seen anything like that at any theme park in my life. Also, in 2020, which was the year masks were required at just about every business in the country, staff weren't enforcing the company's mandate. Our friend's dad asks guest service why this isn't the case, and they said that no one tries to enforce it here because the guests would just throw fights over mask mandates. Again, I've never seen a theme park that literally gives up on the issue because of their clientele. Another thing I don't like is the park's loose article policy that literally makes every attraction an upcharge because what they do is they don't allow anything to stay in your pockets. Coming from a guy who tends to only bring their phone, wallet, and portable charger to a theme park, this might be the only place I've been to where I'm forced to put it in a locker with an expense. Now, this whole thing for safety is fine, still a little annoying, but fine, and my problem with it is that they make you pay for the locker. If you look at other parks like Islands of Adventure or what Cedar Point and Kings Dominion have done on Steel Vengeance and Twisted Timbers, they require a locker, but they are free of charge and double-sided. This is how it should be done, but instead Six Flags Great Adventure makes safety feel like a money grab. The redeeming factor amongst all of this mayhem is the stupidly good collection of roller coasters. I don't think it's arguable, no matter your opinion on the park, that they have one of the best ride lineups in the world. Now, we'll get to that in a second, but first I want to talk about some things I noticed when I revisited the park earlier this year. Since my 2020 visit, I had heard of Six Flags Great Adventure making strides to improve the guest experience, which was great to see. They added single rider lines, sped up the operations, introduced new culinary options, and so much more. With the new Six Flags CEO that took charge recently, it seems like these changes are being made to a lot of the Six Flags parks, which is awesome. Moving away from these minor inconveniences, which I'm well aware may not happen to you when you come to this park, I want to discuss the ride lineup individually. Six Flags Great Adventure is one of the giants of the coaster world, as I stated earlier on in the video. At the moment, they are home to 14 coasters, ranging from extreme thrill to tame family attractions. Their top three, for me, is what makes this park a must-visit if I'm in the area. First, El Toro is an intimate prefabricated wooden coaster that opened at the park in 2006. Not only is it unanimously considered to be the best ride in the park, many will tell you it's the best wooden roller coaster ever built. The ride is an absolute behemoth, with a height of 181 feet, speed of 70 miles per hour, and drop angle of 76 degrees. These stats are almost unheard of for a wooden coaster. The reason El Toro gets so much fanfare is because of its strong ejector airtime moments. It's got one of the best starts to any roller coaster out there, one of the best endings to any wood coaster, but the middle is just okay. Still, it's one of my top 10 favorite roller coasters I've ever ridden and is worth the price of admission alone. Another very prominent ride that you can find here is King Daka. Even for those of you who aren't diehard coaster fanatics, you've probably heard the two words somewhere before. King Daka stands 456 feet tall, making it the tallest roller coaster in the world, and it travels 100 128 miles per hour, making it the second fastest. It's a simple concept, launching you up into a ginormous top hat before spiraling down to earth and hitting the brake run. That said, if you can get in the front row, it's bound to be one of the most unreal experiences you'll have in your life. The speed and adrenaline is just insane, and it's because of those things that King Daka is also in my top 10 overall coasters. My third place pick at the park is their newest roller coaster, Jersey Devil. This ride was highly anticipated when it opened in 2021, but it seems to have lost a lot of hype since then due to its slower than usual pacing for the ride genre. That said, I got three rides on it and each time thought it was an immensely underappreciated coaster. Sure, it might not be off the walls crazy like some of these other RMCs, but it's got a perfect sequence of elements that flow near flawless. Now that the mid-course brake run is tuned properly and the ride has had plenty of time to warm up, I urge you all to give it another shot. Following the big three, Six Flags Great Adventure is home to more coasters by Bollinger and Mabiard than any other on the planet. These five thrill machines are ranked differently depending on who you ask, but my opinion is as follows. 
Personally, Nitro leads the pack of B&Ms at the park. It's a 230-foot-tall hypercoaster with an L-shaped layout consisting of parabolic airtime hills and intense helixes and turns. Now, although I found this ride to be temperamental, I do still enjoy its sustained floater airtime and forceful positive Gs. By no means is it one of my favorite B&M hypercoasters, but it's still a great complement to this park's lineup. Just next door is also Batman the Ride, an inverted coaster known for its intense compact layout. The same ride has been introduced to many Six Flags parks in North America, but I've never gotten bored of these things even a little. If you stick yourself in the back row, you're forced to gray out and take some stupidly whippy elements. A favorite amongst the general public is Superman Ultimate Flight, which is a flying coaster that you can also find at a couple other Six Flags parks. The flying coaster concept allows riders to travel in a prone position through graceful inline twists and a demented face-first pretzel loop. Any coaster enthusiast will tell you that the pretzel loop is one of the most intense elements on any coaster in the world. Not to worry though, the rest of the ride is very easygoing. Medusa, formerly known as Bizarro, is a floorless looping coaster that opened in 1999. This was actually the first ride of its kind way back then, and it's still kicking ass to this day. It features seven inversions, many cool special effects, and it's looking better than ever now that it's undergone that retheme. Green Lantern is located adjacent to Superman Ultimate Flight and like its next door neighbor, gathers some of the longest lines in the park. While it's an outdated concept today, its stand-up ride experience is quite unique and makes for some ultra intense inversions. Me personally, I like stand-up coasters, but it makes sense why many people don't. Moving on from the B&Ms, the first roller coaster you're bound to see when you enter the park is Joker. This SNS 40 free spin is one of the most aggressive of its clone counterparts in the Six Flags chain. It's a pretty simple concept as you flip around in your seat while going through the ride's vertical layout. Many coaster enthusiasts aren't a fan of the free spin model, but it's smooth and intense, so I don't mind it at all. Anyways, that's pretty much all for the thrill category, easily one of the best in the entire world. The rest of the roller coaster lineup consists of a couple indoor family coasters, Dark Knight and Skull Mountain, and you've also got a mine train called Runaway Mine Train, a Tivoli with an obnoxiously long train called Harley Quinn Crazy Train, and the newly introduced Lil Devil Coaster that's appropriately located next to Jersey Devil Coaster. Six Flags Great Adventure isn't home to the most unique non-coaster ride lineup, but they do have a handful of attractions definitely worth mentioning. Zumanjaro Drop of Doom is the world's tallest drop tower located on the inside of Kingda Ka structure. Both times I've been to the park, Zumanjaro has been closed when I've gone to ride it, but having ridden its sister drop tower in California, aka Lex Luthor Drop of Doom at Six Flags Magic Mountain, I'm sure it's an epic experience. Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth is a huge Zamperla pendulum ride that could be found all throughout the Six Flags chain. This is one that I definitely don't mind them cloning everywhere, as it's a really, really fun experience from start to end. There's also two pretty good dark rides here. One is more on the traditional side and is a shooting dark ride. The ride is called Justice League Battle for Metropolis. Again, it's a clone, but it's actually a really well done ride relative to the expectations many have with the company building a dark ride. Then you've got Houdini's Great Escape, which is a Vacoma Madhouse, one of the only a few remaining in the country, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. I've personally never had the chance to ride it, but I hope to do it next time I visit since it looks like a pretty unique attraction. Six Flags Great Adventure is also home to Twister, America's last remaining permanent topspin, as well as two mediocre water rides and the iconic Parachutes ride. I'm sure I could keep going because this park has so many different rides and attractions. Something to consider is although it isn't a ride, the drive through safari experience that the park offers is a very popular attraction. I've never had the chance to do it, but I love that the park cares for a wide variety of animals as only one other park in the Six Flags chain does. To branch over some other topics, Six Flags Great Adventure has a much better variety of food than they used to a few years ago. Since I'm not a local, I don't have any specific recommendations, but they're getting rid of a lot of poor offerings. Also, I have to shout out the recent addition of Single Rider Lines as they were a huge time saver last time I visited the park. Because Great Adventure's operations could be hit or miss, there's no guarantee that this will save you lots of time. Before entering the queue line, be sure to identify the Single Rider Line since it's becoming more and more popular amongst the public. I visited the park in April and I was able to get on Jersey Devil Coast twice with a fraction of the weight as the standby line, and I also walked straight on to Nitro. I believe they also offer this alternative at El Toro and Medusa. The last thing I want to mention in this video is if there's any rain in the forecast, don't be afraid to come here. Many amusement parks, including several in the Six Flags chain, will threaten to stay closed even if there's just a little bit of rain. Six Flags Great Adventure rarely does this, and all of their rides, with the exception of Kingdaka, should stay open as long as there's no thunderstorms. Plus, if the weather's bad for part of the day but then clears up later on, everything will reopen when conditions allow. With all that said and done, do I recommend Six Flags Great Adventure. I'd have to say yeah, and I'm willing to give it a 9 out of 10. Even with all the issues I've had in the past, many of which are being improved upon now, they are just dramatically overshadowed because this park has one of the best variety of rides and roller coasters in the world. All roller coaster fans watching need to give this park a visit at some point in their lives, and all members of the family should be able to have a fun time here. Whenever I come to the park, I feel like there's never enough time to get everything done, so if it's your first time visiting and you want to do everything, plan for two full days. That way, you don't feel rushed and can take your time at one of the world's best amusement parks. With that being said, if you enjoyed my review, I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe as there will be a lot more coaster-related content coming in the future. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you very soon. Bye, guys.